All right. Hello and welcome to How Do Artists, a show that focuses on a single topic of conversation and asks the question, how do artists live, work, play, run their business, stay inspired, or handle challenges and adversity from an artist's perspective? Our show will speak with a diverse group of artists and creatives, and as you, our listeners, will have a chance to ask your questions during our Q&A segment towards the end of our show. I am your co-host, Ryan Caldwell, musician, producer, and I am joined by co-host Carlana Pedersen, artist and illustrator. Thank you. We are so excited. We are so excited to talk to tonight's guest. We are having a conversation with two-time Emmy award-winning composer, producer, and musician, Lucas Cantor. Lucas has worked for the NBC Music Department for their Olympics Games productions, has created film scores for Netflix, DreamWorks Animation, and co-produced Lord's cover of Everybody Wants to Rule the World on the Hunger Games Catching Fire soundtrack plus so much more. Tonight, we are having a discussion with Lucas about a very familiar and often debated subject in the art community, how do artists embrace technology? Thank you for joining us tonight, Lucas. How are you? I'm good, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I'm having a little bit of an issue with this button, so it might just open up. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just, just gonna give the audience what they want, you know? Well, hey, hey, you're always allowed <laughs> to open up to us. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that is what I, what I plan to do, and, and and it's totally not because it's quarantine and I've been wearing this shirt for three days. That's absolutely not. Right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Well, you know, I know that we had mentioned that our topic for the day is going to be technology, but before we sort of get into the to the throes of that main topic, maybe you can help our listeners kind of give a little backstory as to how you got here in your career and how it kind of started for you. Yeah, well, um, I think probably the most relevant question uh, to answer is why would you be talking to me about how artists uh, deal with technology? And I think the simple answer is that I am the composer who finished Schubert's Unfinished Symphony with artificial intelligence. Yeah, um, I was actually just, I, I, I am, I'm, I'm one you of them. I, I think I, I might be the only one so far. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, this was a project I did in 2019 and it's been uh, performed around the world. We did you know Schubert? It's Schubert's Eighth Symphony. He wrote two movements, sketched the third movement. We, for creative and technological reasons, decided to ignore his sketch of the third movement and just generate two new movements. Um, and yeah, it's been performed around the world, and it's a pretty interesting thing to have a non-human intelligence channel the intelligence of a deceased human artist and <laughs> collaborate with that. That's it was uh, intense and interesting, and it has gotten me thinking a lot about the role of technology in the arts generally, which is uh, good because you need something heady and uh, interesting to think about when you're stuck at home and of not course. able to go anywhere. And trying yeah. to sleep, yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, well I, have, I have two. I have two toddlers, so there's there's not much. Oh. There's no sleeping. I, w I was gonna say, how is how is collaborating with the uh, technology? You know, reanimated uh, spirit of a dead guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it was uh, it was great. Uh, it was really as, fun. As far um, as collaborations go. <laughs> As far as collaborations go, it was among my stranger ones. It was maybe not the absolute weirdest, but it was it was up there. And what um, made it strange? What was what well, other than the obvious? What really was strange about it? Was it the it's, technology? It was, it was, the workflow was strange because I was in addition to usually I'm used to collaborating with composers where I send them music and they send me you know ideas back or music back or with uh you know storytellers of whatever stripe and so I send them music and we talk about how it does or does not fit the story. Um, <laughs> but I'm not used, usually used to um, collaborating with a tech team. And that's, so part of what I, part of the adjustment I had to make was on the one hand, I had to be creative and be doing music things and writing music. And on the other hand, I had to be right. talking to these computer scientists in a language that they would understand. And also we had to, I mean, it's a machine learning model. So we had to train it to do what we wanted. And that was a, a process of trial and error all in, in itself. So. So the whole thing was just, I mean, it's just, you know, when I work on a film, the way that you score a film workflow wise is pretty prescribed. I and mean, we've been doing it for a hundred plus years. We kind of have a system at this point, but there really is no system for create, creating concert music with artificial intelligence. So we just invented <laughs> it as we went. That's fine. Well. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, and it's such, it's such kind of a crazy concept too. Okay. But wait, so, so, like in, in your, in your career, like what, what has brought you to that point of going and, and like, cause I mean, obviously you're a composer and a producer, right. And, mm -hmm. and a musician, and but a musician. like, 
So like, or are you one of these people who has been, who's been taking, you know, who's been studying guitar since you were in diapers or, you know, did you pick it up at some <laughs> other later point or? Yes, I picked it up at a later point. So I, I've told the story, <laughs> um, I've told the story before, but so actually my favorite, so apparently I tell the story a lot and my favorite time that I was ever asked to t- tell it was on a podcast with a woman who was a middle school teacher. And she was like, I really want you to tell the story of how you got into guitar. And I didn't know what she was talking about, but then I remembered. Yes. Um, so I was in middle school. Um, cause I don't, I assume nobody really listens when you tell your origin story, but, um, but mine is that I was, I was in middle school and there was a guitar like in the, you know, student common area. And there was this girl that I really wanted to impress, uh, whose name I remember, but I'm not going to embarrass her. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, I thought if I learn like, you know, something on this guitar, maybe she'll like think I'm cool. And I had a free period. And so I learned how to play that. Like, Oh, actually watch here. I learned how to play this Metallica song. It's, it's just all open strings. You can play it with one hand. <laughs> right? and so I learned how to play that on a, on a guitar. And then when she came in from her class, I kind of was casually just like, you know, trying to jam out in the background. And she didn't notice or care. But I really got into playing the guitar. And so it never really worked out with me and her. But I fell in love with the guitar that day. And I started taking lessons. And I, I never stopped. But that's pretty late for most musicians to, to start at around 14. That, Did you yeah. know you were going to do this? Did you know when you picked up the guitar, this was going to be something that you wanted to do as a career or, or did this just sort of, how did this materialize for you? Yeah. I, you know, I want to tell the story that everybody wants to hear about how I always knew what I wanted to do. And no, you know, I, always know been passionate. Story. I know I'm just, I just, I feel like that's, that's what I, that's what I like, you know, in the biopic of my life. Yeah. I picked up the guitar and there was a really nice music <laughs> cue that sort of swelled indicating to the audience that it was my future <laughs> destiny. But um, the reality is I started playing. I enjoyed it. It was an uh, interesting thing that was kind of different for me. My parents are both artists. They're, uh, my, my mom is a writer and my dad's a filmmaker. And okay. so it was like a way to be artistic. But um, thank you. It was a way to be uh, art- I, I did a great job choosing parents. <laughs> um, it, was a, <laughs> it was a way to be artistic, but without being in either of their you know, right. realms, which is interesting. Um, of course, I ended up later going into film music and um, also writing. So I'm definitely Funny very much in both of their realms now. Yeah. Um, Funny how that but it was, uh, yeah. And I, I, I studied for uh, privately for years. I got into playing in bands. And then um, when I was in college, I went to one semester of school where I was going to, you know, I don't know, be a, a drinking major, I guess, was my plan. <laughs> and but I realized I, I, and I, and I had gotten a, this is people don't know this about me, most people, but I'm a, I'm a an undercover jock. I actually got a scholarship to play lacrosse. Oh. And so I was on the lacrosse team, but after one semester, I realized I spent all my time playing in this band that I had formed. And so I went to music <laughs> school after that. Um, nice. Well, yeah. Was, and then well, the rest well, what, is history. Well, what style of music was the band? Uh, like stony jam band music, I guess. Nice. <laughs> yeah, like, the, like the drunker you are, the better you sound. Was that kind of yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right, so guitar is your instrument of choice. What other instruments do you play? Since you you do say that you are multi instrumental, so what would that? Yeah, include? so I I say that I play twenty five instruments, and I, I don't know. So I mean, it depends on how you divide them, right? So like, <laughs> is electric guitar and acoustic guitar the same thing? They're similar, but there's different similar. techniques. That's I play, right. Yeah. I play five string, but, but I have like 25 different instruments in my studio. I'm in a different studio now, but I have 25 different instruments that I play and they're, you know, guitars. I think I have five different, four different kinds of banjo, uh, mandolin, mandola, uh, something called a baglamas that I'd show you if I had one, um, you know, different, but anything the basically things with frets that you can play with a pick. So anything that's like that, I can pretty much play. And I've gotten to the point now where I have so many of those doubles that like, I can pretty much play one, even if I've never picked one up or heard it before. I can right. figure it wow. out pretty quick and, you know, get something out of it at least. Yeah. Um, it's, wow. like, it's like learning romance languages. Once, once yeah. you know French, Latin and Italian, you can probably figure out a lot of Spanish. <laughs> yeah. I would say, I mean, you, you know, this is anyone who speaks Portuguese is going to hate me for this, but I feel like if I'm reading Portuguese, I cause I speak Spanish pretty well. Okay. Not very well, but well enough. And yeah. so I can I can kind of read Portuguese, which leads me to believe that Portuguese is just kind of mispronounced Spanish. <laughs> Quote me. All right. <laughs> come at me, come at me, Brazilians. 
Oh, oh my goodness. All right. So that's, that's pretty interesting. I don't know if we want resilient Brazil to, to come at us, but, but I, I get it. It's all right. So it's it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. Anyway. So, in the process of technology and you working in technology um, as a creative, how has it influenced you specifically and personally in terms of your own? So, so the, so it's not like when I started working with Schubert, that was the first time I'd ever worked with technology. Um, of course. Technology is, I mean, look where we are guys. Right. No, uh, have you two ever been in the same room physically? Once. Oh yeah. Once. Oh, Once. Okay. Well, Once we never have. COVID. <laughs> Yeah, so like we we never have, and we're I mean I don't I if I remember correctly you're in Chicago, but I don't even know that for a fact, right? So we're speaking to each other um, yeah. through an amazing array of communications and protocols and video codices and audio codices that are completely invisible to us because good technology is helpful and great technology is invisible. So we don't even think about this, and the right. technology that I use every day to compose music is invisible to me. I don't sit at a oaken desk with a quill and ink to write music. I sit at a, oh. at a digital, I know, disappointing. That looks so much fun though. <laughs> You're missing out. <laughs> when I, when does, I, it, I, does it look fun? <laughs> even the people, even my friends who, who say, who like write music, who like to write from the score first, they usually, what they mean by that is that they would like to write from like Sibelius or like a digital, right? Like, right. Yeah, it's just a digital different interface of a digital audio workstation. So, yeah. um, every piece of music that you, the audience, have heard, certainly in the last twenty years and probably ever, has been um, aided by technology. I mean, oh, if you yeah. heard it and there wasn't someone performing it for you live, it got to you through some kind of technology, and that's only grown um, over the last uh, over the last hundred years. So. Um, so technology is a part of music and it's an indelible and like permanent part of music. And anyone who oh, makes yeah. music deals with technology all the time. Well, exactly. So, without, without recording, we don't have music and recording is inherently technology, but I without do. Printing, we don't have music. Well, exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess technically the quill is technology. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but as I mean, far we as, don't have, yeah, uh, I was going to say as far as being on the cutting edge of technology though, because I think that's the part that most people fixate on is just how like how embracing are you of new technologies, new things like, you know, I mean, of course, anyone who's doing music nowadays, it's, it's obligatory that you need to know how to use a computer and that computer needs to have a digital audio workstation on it. You need to have your own, your own like mini recording rig in your home. You know, it's the obligatory, the obligatory home studio for a lot of people. That's but, true. But there's also like, you know, but there's also the kind of the forefront edge of that stuff. I mean, AI is one of those things, but another one, uh, another application of that is like uh, this plugin I saw recently where they go and it's like a neural network that goes and maps out all the samples you have on your computer and allows and gives you a graphical interface to go and sort through them based on how yeah, send me a link to that. I don't, I've never heard of that. Send me a link to that. <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I could definitely use that. There's, I mean, so I was an assistant for a composer named Michael Levine, and we were working at uh, Remote Control, which is Hans Zimmer's studio, and they're like a, okay. obviously very technocratic over there. And sure. at the time that I worked there, the composing rig was like nine different computers, and I swear half of my job was like, there's this cello sample that I used in 1975, and I know <laughs> I have it somewhere. And like half of it was just going and trying to find that kind of stuff. But um, and I, 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 but now I'm, you know, now I'm 10 or so years down the road, I kind of have the same thing where like, I know that on this one cue on this one movie in 2011, I used this one sample that was really great. What was it? I don't remember, you know? Well, and I feel like so, so much of art is like, until you get burned by it, it's all fire and forget, you know, it's like, did it, finished it next. But you know, then, then the more times you're like, I wish I had access to specifically that thing. <laughs> you know, that's funny. Cause I, that is actually one of the first things I learned when I started working um, for Michael was really being diligent about file names and archiving things yeah. and printing stems and making sure that your stuff is uh, bulletproof so that you can recall it later. And that's a habit I developed over the years. And I know that a lot of sort of like indie, or I mean, I guess I'm an indie artist, but a lot of <laughs> maybe less experienced musicians like, you know, have a lot of like untitled number one on, on their, <laughs> on their hard drives. I don't have a single thing like that. Actually, um, I was know, working I with a friend last I, yeah. night. Yeah, I was working with a friend last night who just had like music folder, and then just, and there was like at yeah. least thirty something uh, untitled projects. 
<laughs> well, so I spent today, actually most of today, I spent going through old music because I've been releasing a lot of my stuff on Spotify. And I, I think I have enough to release a track every two weeks for the next like three or four years. Like I've got nice. so much stuff I haven't released. <laughs> and, nice. um, and so I'm going to, so I'm doing that, but I'm going through it and, and I'm like, I'm, hi, I'm high-fiving my former self for like having organized <laughs> these things in the way that they're organized. Um, nice. that's, speaking of that, talk to us a little bit about your latest release, Space Hustle. And, and Oh, Space Hustle, yeah. And how that came about and I yeah. and give us a little story, a little backdrop on that. So this ties into technology also. I um, right. yeah. So I met this drummer named Herb Pierker in Vienna. Um, and he was in a band called Foul Fiction, I think. That was he's just and they were they were like a jazz band. I played with them a little bit, and they're just so good. Like he's just such a good drummer. He does all this kind of like analog drum and bass sounding stuff. Okay. And so we uh, we kept you know we kept each other's info, and then when he moved to when he came to New York to visit, I said, "Can you just come up to my studio and record a bunch of stuff? Like I'll just, just come up here for a few hours. I'll put on a click track, just record me a bunch of like four minute things." Because he was only in town for a few days, and we didn't have time to really do an album, but I really right. wanted to do an album with him. So he did that, and then uh, my engineer and I, over the next couple of weeks, sat down and just recorded over what he had done, um, and and then we finished it. And I thought it was so cool but who was ever going to like it? And, you know, what's the point of releasing this? And I forgot about it. And then I thought that I had lost it. And then COVID happened and I was just going through all these old hard drives. Right. And, you know, it was just one day I had nothing else to do. And so I was going through all these old hard drives and I found this album and it was pretty much, you know, one master away from being done. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was like, well, I should release this. And um, so it's 13 years old. I released it and it has been my most, uh, successful independent release which oh, has taught me the lesson that like release your stuff you idiot I'm talking to myself right now like, <laughs> nobody can pass judgment on it like it or not like it if you don't make it available to them that's so, the thing right. yeah yeah no it's so a, and yeah go ahead oh no i was just gonna say it's, it's kind of yeah it's unavoidable well it's hard i mean because because people tend to not release things for one reason or another i mean i, I i've spent some good a good amount of time hoarding tracks just you know ones that are even just almost done or just like 98 percent of the way there just you know for no good reason but like what what reasons yeah. do you what reasons do you hoard mixes <laughs> so <laughs> what reasons do i hoard mixes so the um the, there, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one was time, and I was just—I was so focused in the last ten years since I moved to Los Angeles. I was so focused on getting, you know, getting the next job and like making making it on the film music scene. I guess that I I just didn't have time to deal with stuff that didn't that didn't go, you know, that didn't like immediately need to be released. And yeah. and just to be so just like I, I say, it's my it was my most successful independent release. I've released other stuff where I'm like a producer or, you know, it's part of a, the soundtrack to a show that right. is done, you know, exponentially better. But this is, this one, no, there's no reason for people to listen to it other than that they like it. You know, it's not like for anything. So, right, um, right. but the, but yeah, I've, and I've just been, you know, I've been focused on, on working on like the, you know, the jobs that, that pay me and, um, and I just kind of forgot about a lot of this stuff. And some of, some of the things that I'm releasing were demos that I did where I really just went all in on the demo and then, either did get the job or didn't get the job, but the demo never got used uh, for anything. And, and the, the reason that I hoard them is like, I think like you, sometimes I feel like they're 90% of the way there. And in going through all my back catalog stuff, what I realized is like, there is a good amount of juvenilia in there and stuff that I wouldn't want to release. And, right. but there's also a bunch of stuff in there that like I didn't think was ready at the time and listening to it with some perspective, it's, it's good. Space yeah, right. also fell into that category. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't think there is a reason that Horde mixes. And I also, maybe this is a controversial statement, but I don't think it's art until you release it. I think if you make a piece of music and you keep it and no one ever hears it, then it's just, you're, it's, it's not art. It's not like part of art is sharing with a community and, yeah. you know, the purpose of, um, music and all art is to bring, you know, I, I guess pleasure, but maybe just, you know, some feeling oh, yeah. to everybody. And if you make a piece of music or a piece of art and it only brings you pleasure, then, you know. What are you doing? <laughs> so then it's not art? So if it's like, sort of like the if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound kind of concept? Uh, I mean, it's more like if yeah. a tree falls in the woods and then you just like don't tell anyone about it, it's never going to become <laughs> lumber. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. It's just going to sit there and rot and die and no one's ever going to know that it fell. 
Yeah, basically. Hmm. Well, being a visual artist. <laughs> I oh, don't, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't... I don't know, because I know a lot of people who are artists who who don't really um, sell their work or put it out there, but they they just create because that makes them feel good. So is that Mm -hmm. is that less art? Yes, (laughs) Yes, I think so. Hard because takes. Part, part of the part of the well, process of art, part of the like putting your soul into it, is yeah. putting it out there to be judged. Because if you put everything into it, I mean, you either did or you didn't, but no one will ever know. You know, yeah, and you you, you have to submit. You have to submit to the tribunal. And well, they and that I think that's that's the scariest part, and that's why some people don't do it. You know, and but honestly, I don't know if it makes it less art. Well, though. and honestly, I, I, I tend to agree, though, yeah. but I, I, my, my perspective on that tends to more be that, I mean, sure, it's art. It's just not useful art because, you know, you've just kept it all to yourself. How dare you keep your art to yourself? <laughs> What's wrong with those people? They have to like they have to share it to go and enrich someone else's life. What if that piece of art is the one thing that, you know, picks that person's day up or keeps them from going to 7-Eleven again or I don't know. Well, there's Strange. also two, there's two, like, there's two narratives, you know, art is, yeah. art is, is narrative, right? And like, yeah. the, um, and it's if you don't release it, too. Yeah. it's subjective. It, it is definitely subjective, but if you don't, if you don't release it, then it has no story. It's only story is that you made it. And like yeah. writing a piece of music d- gives me pleasure. Like I enjoy writing music and I enjoy the act of writing music and I enjoy for the most part, listening to the music that I've written, but yeah. that is something personal. I mean, that's just, it's just like, you know, I also enjoy cycling, you know, but that's not art and I'm not a professional cyclist. Like if I wanted to take that to the next level, I'd have to go to a race and be timed and like watch a bunch of 26 year olds lap me 50 times. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's, 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 it's like, and, and I, you know, nothing, I have nothing against people who do art as a hobby, but I reject the notion that like there's some art that is for the public and there's some art that is for you. I mean, there's some stuff that you, you know, I, I, I yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I reject that. I reject that notion. I think it's, it's not art until you publish it. I think that's an essential part of the process. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, I tend to be in agreement with that, but you know, I'd be lying if I said I didn't have some, some tracks that I'm, I hesitate to release because they're too personal. Well, oh, you know, I, I'm a hundred percent with you on that, <laughs> but, like, I, but yeah. No, I, I think that's an interesting perspective. And I think that's, I think that's a view that I have heard um, from my musician friends and family. <laughs> and, and, and my dad was a musician. My mother was a musician. I, I kind of heard that argument, especially from my father, who was a, a jazz musician, who believed that art, his craft was only was only in its completion when he played in front of people. So, mm-hmm. so being a visual artist, um, I, I do know that there are some artists that feel that way, but I also know that there's a lot of visual artists that feel the opposite way. And, and if we're sort of talking about this in, in its, in its essence, as it relates to technology, even I know that musicians far more have to, to be technical than visual artists do. Um, your lives depend on it in terms of keeping up with with technology because that's how the music gets created for the most part and shared. Whereas um, a visual artist, a lot of times they don't have to use technology. Um, I feel like I feel it's easier for them to sort of be on the outs with it. So how do you what do you how, what would you say or what advice would you give to to those artists that are not or who have sort of backed off from too much technology and are are really sort of resistant to that, to that notion or to that feeling they, yes, they're on the computer. Yes. They're using it. They're, they've got a phone. I mean, they are doing the things that they need to because they're a part of our society, but there is a whole influx of, of artists that really are not interested in 
too much technology. What, what would you say to them? Oh, real, real quick. I want to give a shout out while we're on this topic to my friend, Jawan, who is in the live, who is in the live chat. Cause he just, he just bought a tape machine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, welcome, yeah. welcome to the middle of the 20th century. <laughs> Anyhow, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Um, what would I say to artists who refuse to embrace technology? Well, too much technology. I mean, there everybody's everyone has everyone is in technology because you have to be. You so can't. most of the visual artists I know, even the ones who sell their art professionally, and even the ones who don't, and are just sort of visual artists by. Uh, because they love to do it, have five and six figure Instagram followings just because people like to look at art and it's an easier way to look at someone's work than oh, to yeah. go to a gallery wherever they happen to live. Right. Um, like, uh, Carlana, I, you know, it's unlikely that I'm going to see a piece of your work in person. In, at least it's, de I'm definitely not going to in the near future, but I have <laughs> seen your stuff on the internet. It's lovely and I like oh, it. Oh, I love and, technology. I'm all and I'm about way more, tech. But my point is that I'm also way more likely to, like, if I'm in Chicago, to go see a show because now I've seen some of your stuff. Um, and so I guess that's, like, one thing is that I feel like the visual arts do embrace technology to a pretty high degree. Um, and, I mean, uh, and another another way to put that is that, you know, one of the probably the most, pos the most uh, popular visual art today is film. And, you know, film is all about technology and it's almost entirely digital today yeah. um so and then to artists who are like refuse to embrace technology as a some sort of statement i would just say what what is the statement that you're making with that and is that serving your art because in some cases uh there are people who like chris feely for example is a mandolin player and i know uh and you know possibly the greatest living musician but um <laughs> certainly not, certainly on a list of and he's on there he's um but he he prefers to record with one omnidirectional microphone and the whole band sitting around to tape. That's what he likes to do. And the statement that that makes in his music is a, that it's, that it's, um, it's not produced in the way that a lot of music is produced. Like when, when I record bluegrass, I'm recording one instrument at a time. It's a completely different, it's All a completely right. different process. And B like the heyday of bluegrass and really when it was born was, uh, captured on record and it was recorded in a certain way and right. he pays homage to that tradition by continuing to record in that way even though that is not the way that we record most things today right, right so so that says something like that lack of an embrace of technology says something about what you're doing if okay. he did that because he didn't want to deal with pro tools because pro tools is stupid <laughs> that would be a non-reason you know um so so yeah so i would ask like what if you're if you're intentionally as part of your artistic uh, statement rejecting technology, I would want to know what you're trying to say with that rejection. And I think that some people would have a really interesting answer to that. And some people would just yes, they do. be like, I can't figure <laughs> out computers. And I, you know, it's, so that's that. Um, <laughs> right. I was one of those people. I didn't have like, I couldn't deal with email until I was, had graduated from college and I didn't know how to run a board or do any music technology stuff until I moved to LA and was forced to learn it because I, mm may or may not have taken a job where I may or may not have suggested that I already knew a lot of that stuff. Um, and so, uh, on the job yeah. training, can't beat it. On the job training. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's totally okay. Well, so let, let's go and dig into the meat and potatoes though. Music technology Ooh. nowadays is going and flirting with the concept of artificial intelligence, which is in, incredibly broad and expansive technology yeah. that has a lot of different applications and is mostly just a buzzword in a lot of circles. Yeah, we're beyond <laughs> flirting. We're beyond flirting. The clothes are off. We have gone way beyond flirting. Pants are down. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, artificial, artificial intelligence is a very broad term. And, you know, in some cases, it means an Excel spreadsheet on the back end with a really cool looking front end. And in right. some cases it means a machine learning model that doesn't really do anything intelligible. And in some cases it means um, some kind of machine learning model, some kind of network of computers that actually produces intelligible music. And yeah. um, the, there are a couple of companies I, I just for, I just like don't want to name drop any, so I'm not going to, but there are a couple <laughs> that make music that is, at the very least listenable and in some cases pretty good. And um, that is 
where I would say production music, which is like the type of music that you buy by the, you know, by the pound for YouTube videos or reality right. television shows or whatever. You're talking about stock? Production music. Production. Yeah, well, stock music thir- 20 years ago when I first started doing music was just like the most awful stuff you've ever heard. Right. And now, like I have done production music. I've done production music recording sessions at Abbey Road with a full orchestra. It's as good as anything else out there. Right. And right. it's just evolved over the years, partly because there's money and partly because, you know, technology has made it easier. Um, and I think artificially intelligent AI music is going to follow the same tra- trajectory. It's, it's easy to laugh at it now because it's, it's, you know, it's okay. Like the, the best AI created music that is not human assisted is fine, but not amazing. But you know, it's only been around for a couple of years. Yeah. So it will, it will get better and it will get to the point where you are not going to be able to tell the difference. Okay. So, Oh, no, you go. No, I was going to say, is, is that good for the industry? Is that good for musicians? Is that where musicians specifically in music want to go with that? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no to all of those questions. It, 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 um, it, it hurts my insides. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't, so I can't speak for, I can't speak for all musicians on where they want to go. Maybe some of them, right. that is what they want to do. Uh, like obviously the musicians who have created these pieces of AI do want to go in that direction and that's, that's fine. <laughs> but the, um, but as far as, is it good for the industry? No, it's like, it's terrible for the industry, but um, I don't, uh, how do I put this charitably? The music industry is the most technophobic and slow acting industry that I'm aware of. Maybe it's just cause I'm in it. Maybe every industry is like this, but yeah. I don't think so. And the, the pattern of the music industry is um, ignore the technological change. Um, then try to stifle the technological change. And then eventually there's a hostile takeover where the music business becomes whatever that technology was. So it started, uh, the first time this happened was, you know, music here, I'll, I'll give you some, uh, I'll uh, pretend to be a, you know, mid Atlantic uh, music publishing. Now real music's done in print. You know, real music is print. It's books that you sell to people who have pianos. That's what music is. All this recorded nonsense, this is never going to catch on. Right, and then of yeah. course, record companies become the de facto music industry. And now fast right. forward a hundred years later, you know, real music is sold on CDs. Nobody's ever going to want to listen to music on their computer. This is, you know, this is a fad. And now, um, you know, obviously all music is digital. And then, you know, real music is on a platform that you pay for where you buy it by the song. And now obviously the de facto delivery system for music is streaming services. Right. So, so you know, it's, the, it's only... this, what will happen with AI, I believe, is, you know, real music is made by humans. And then eventually it's, they're just, it's just going to find some kind of foothold in the market and it's going to raise billions and billions of dollars and then it'll have a sufficient marketing budget. And there you go. Yeah. Game over. Thanks oh, for playing. Wow. It does seem like it would be. It does seem difficult to market. I think. I think it, it's hard to go and build build a relationship with a computer like that. But you know, no, it's hard to build a relationship with a pop star you've never met. Also, That's also true. Yeah. You know. You know who? I mean, it's just you know. You need some good writers. I mean, if the, if the internet if the internet has taught us anything, it's that I think writers can make it can sell anything and can make anything happen. And yeah. you know, one of the things that I've been sort of obsessed with, for better or worse, is these scam gurus uh, oh, that are no. out there all over the internet. And, the, and, and I've mm. learned that the system is like, you buy a pre-made script, you make a bunch of sort of nonsense videos, and then you go out and sell a course about how to become successful like you. But the reason that you're successful is because you're selling all these courses, not because you're doing the thing that the course teaches you to do. And um, my point in all this is that narrative is everything. And oh, yeah. that people are inherently susceptible to sort of believe what's in front of them and someone will come up with the right story for artificial intelligence. And it only takes one, like it only takes one hit and then we'll just sort of accept it. That's, that's wow. a thing though. No, <laughs> I mean, a- the way you lay it out, it seems completely inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> well, <good. laughs> well, and if we're thinking about things on that terms, what other aspects um, in the arts industry have a real possibility of being reduced or eliminated by, by AI or by tech? Well, I didn't say they'd be eliminated and I didn't say music was going to end. Or I reduced. said that the music business is going to fundamentally change. Well, I don't even know if they'll be reduced. I think that the, um, the, if we start consuming more music made by AI, that I don't think that's going to mean that less people play instruments. I just think it's going to mean that less people 
are able to play instruments professionally. Um, and that, that is sad and that's a problem, but that has been happening for the last several hundred years. I mean, mm -hmm. 70 years ago, if you wanted to hear music in a bar, that was pretty much, you, you needed people in the bar to play the music. Right. And there was in the 1940s, in the early 1940s, this is the reason that we don't have evidence of the birth of bebop is because musicians got together and went on strike and stopped recording for two years because they noticed that uh, the clubs that they were playing and the restaurants that they were playing and the bars that they were playing at were just buying record players and not hiring them anymore. And so they thought what they would do is go on strike and that that would solve the problem. What that really did was, you know, it was a proof of concept. <laughs> that, right. Um, you know, uh, and um, so the, and the, but, but it's, it made it so that like the career that I wanted, if you would ask me in college, I wanted to play like on a circuit and tour and play jazz in a band. And when I got into college, that almost a little bit existed still, not really. And right. by the time I got out of college, it just, I mean, it just doesn't exist at all. Yeah. You know, there are some bands that are able to do that, but it used to be that you could just, you know, I mean, that there was a club and they were, you know, a train ride apart and they were just looking for music and all you had to do was schedule it. So, um, and yeah, to some degree, I guess that still exists a little bit, but you can't really make a living off of it because they don't want to pay you. Um, yeah. No, live, so, live music is not in a great state. <laughs> well, right now it's in a particularly <laughs> bad state. Yeah. But it's been, in a, it's been in, a, in a decline for a long time. And the reason for that is the proliferation of recording. And the um, proliferation of AI will have a similar effect. The other, like the other side of that, is that the proliferation of recording has given rise to a completely different industry and a completely different kind of musician. Like I, as a musician who plays twenty-five different instruments and records them for other people or for myself, wouldn't have existed in the thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. Yeah, you know that. Like th the thing that I do was not possible or practical even at the beginning of my career, really. And now it's easy. I can do it with a you know a couple thousand dollar investment in home recording equipment and oh, yeah. a much wow. larger investment in instruments. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that no that and that's absolutely a thing. And I, I identify with that a lot because I used to, you know, initially in my in my in my high school days, I was like, I want to be a composer. And then slowly I was like, well, you'd be a composer, you could just be a producer. And you know, in a lot of ways, it's mostly the same thing at this point. And then, you know, yeah, it just kind of slowly morphs from there. And like, what well, what does being a producer mean? And I think that's an interesting question for nowadays because the term producer has meant a lot of different things over the last hundred years, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's <laughs> it's, it's a meaningless term, right? Um, yeah. So as a when I say that I'm a producer, I, I guess what that signals to clients is that um, you can trust me with a music project, and I will figure out the details of it and get you the music that you want. Right. So I think that's what it means. Well, and, it, and, and sometimes and it's, that means playing it myself, and sometimes that means hiring people to play it. It just depends on the situation. Well, and the funniest thing is that's kind of it's more similar to what a producer was back in, like you know, the that's what the a wee, producer does, right? Well, in the in the wee days of recording, basically the person right. in charge of the production. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to take back in what I said. It's not a meaningless term. It means the producer is the person who's responsible for the end result. Right. Right. Yeah. But right. that being said, the actual, like, what that person's doing day to day or hour to hour nowadays is completely different. Yeah. Chief cook and dishwasher. That's what he <laughs> right? is. You know, scheduling stuff. And I mean, you guys produce this podcast, and I'll, I'll let the um, I'll let the listeners in on a little secret. Like, there is a intense level of organization and Google Docs and forms and timed emails that go along with being on the show. We didn't all just decide to show up here 40 minutes ago and do no. this. And there's a lot of work that these guys are doing behind the scenes that is the work of like, you know, I mean, it's intern type stuff, but they don't have interns, so they have to do it. I'm assuming you guys do most of it yourself. Yeah, you know? oh, we it's, do. It's, we, do yeah. we should get interns. Oh, <laughs> I want interns. Hey, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> I love lackeys. It's great. But, but when you're the producer, like when you're the producer, you have to, whatever has to get done, you have to get it done. So yeah. it doesn't mean you have to do it yourself, but you have to get it done. And if there's no one around to do it, you have to do it. Right. That's crazy. Actually, okay, so here's a weird question. AI producers, you think that could be a thing? Ooh. Uh, there are some aspects of um, of my job that could be done by, that would be better done by AI. I mean, organizing <laughs> organizing audio files, you know, Can that's I not something one? I should do. Yeah, data entry, that's not something I should have to do. Right. Uh, you know, there are there are a lot of things that, I, I don't think that there's going to be an AI producer in the in the sense that, 
you'll you'll tap it. Maybe though, you'll, like maybe you'll tap an AI to like organize a concert for you. There, there is, in theory, no reason why they shouldn't be. I mean, when I've organized even the largest concerts, ninety yeah. percent of my job was sending emails. Right. You know? Right. And I, so <laughs> I, I guess. Well, I actually. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a stupid way to put it. Because 90% of my job was knowing what emails to send and to whom. Right. And what to put in them. Uh, so, so yeah, but there, but there was a lot of it that was, uh, you know, a lot of it is scheduling and yeah. uh, dealing with vendors and working out stuff that really could be, you know, where I called someone and they gave me a price. And, you know, probably that could have been done by, you know, the, by, a, by, by a sufficiently sophisticated AI. So we'll see. Yeah. How long do you think? How long do you think we'll get to that point where AI is involved in our lives to that degree where we can sort of hand off those types of projects within the industry where, um, where people are doing this now? How far do you think we have? That question is too general for me to answer because AI is already really involved in our lives. And so well, I don't know. I, I mean, like, how long before AI can, like, send the emails that I would send to, like, produce Being more involved in in the arts industry to the point where where we now, as artists, have to think, oh, oh, hold on for a second. We it's, are not it's competing hard to, so, with AI. Again, it's hard to imagine it being more involved. I mean, the, the way That's that the you discover music is because an algorithm, like, tells you you're going to like it. And, and it's usually and um, it's usually the way you right. Films. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, I mean, who knows? I mean, if you wanted to listen, to, you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's either right or like it'll never be able to. You'll, there's no way to test whether you would have liked something else better. You know, they can only you know. But right. if you look at what it puts in front of you, it assumes you like it. I've been um I've been messing with the Instagram algorithm recently oh. by just unliking every ad. So like I, I say like hide this ad. And it's irrelevant to me. Like no matter what it is, I've just been unliking it and saying that it's irrelevant. And it has started sending me ads for like gutter reinstalling and uh, like plumbers. Like it doesn't know what to send me anymore. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so if you need a good plumber, I got you covered. If you need a good plumber in Illinois, I got you covered. Um, well, that, and that, that's what I like yeah. to think. You know, like I. You know, I, I go, I like a lot of very strange things, and I like to think mm. that in all the algorithms, I'm officially in their other category. Yeah. <laughs> I think you gotta reset your accounts. For, I think like I think you gotta reset your accounts every now and then, and that's like one of the things I do on YouTube too. Is yeah. like I'll just after a couple of days of getting the same thing sent to me over and over again, I'll just search a bunch of just random unrelated stuff, you know, <laughs> for a while, and then and then it'll start giving you different things, you know, um, because otherwise you end up you end up just seeing the same the same ideas and the same people over and over and over again, and it can very easily seem like that's what the world is. Um, that is that okay. is true. I got I got a question for you about music and AI. Is there any advances that you are eagerly looking forward to? I am eagerly looking forward to artificial intelligence that can create stems and uh, take mu like there are a lot of technical things that I do that if I explain them to you, you'd fall asleep, and so would your audience. But they are not yet a they are not yet done by artificial intelligence, like. What I would love an AI to do is for me to finish a piece of music yeah. and then press a button and have a red thing start glowing and then have that music be printed on a stage ready for players to play. And oh, there are yeah. a lot of steps in between that are now done by humans. And some of them, like orchestration, I would want to still be done by humans, but right. there's a lot of technical stuff that I have to do just moving files from place to place that um, right. could probably be done by an AI. No, I, I, know, I know exactly what you mean that's and there, there there are a lot of steps that even converting audio data into midi data is still not great right yeah and there's there's a lot of there's a lot there are a lot of yeah there are just a lot of steps in film music if uh when, when i'm on a more film music specific podcast if any of your listeners want to sort of follow me i do talk about this kind of stuff it's just it is not like there there are too many words i would have to explain in order to even get there but basically you you know you have to you have to make several different versions of a piece of music in order to get it to be played by people. And there's just a lot of steps between me writing it and someone playing it. Right. And well, some of them are creative, but a lot of them are technical and could just be done by an AI. And so I would love that. I'd also love an AI to just organize all of my music for me. And they have, they have AIs that in theory can do that, but yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if I trust them quite yet. They're getting better though. Right. 
Well, and there's also like the first version of that technology and then the, you know, actual consumer grade one that becomes an industry standard or like mm. one that is actually meant for people to use on the whole, you know, like there's TiVo and then there was, you know, everything that's come after it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What that's happened true. to TiVo, man? They were, a, they were a verb and now they're just, they just, they just lost that market. I don't know. They got deep probably a subject for a different podcast. <laughs> yeah. They were, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. They're gone. Well, there's some theories, but. <laughs> was it the lizard people? It was the lizard people. How did you know that? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, it's always the lizard. It comes back to the lizard people. And with their weird flicky tongues. I don't like them. Licking yeah. their eyeballs. It's not great. <laughs> Anyhow. I think when I when I think of AI, I'll tell you what I think of. What do you think? And of? this is largely in part because of what has actually happened. Um, not just the computer aspect of it being a a program. Um reading numbers and, and doing actual uh, mathematical computations. Okay, that's w one aspect of AI. But I think I have the Orwellian sort of thought process in my head about like robots and, and this whole thing of, you know, that taking over society. And it was, I think it was, it was, compounded by the fact that um, there has been the first AI machine learning robot that actually was um, the only AI that was deemed a citizen of Saudi Arabia. And that happened a few years ago. And I'm not lying. I'm not even going to say the name. Anyone who's listening can just Google you know, the first Saudi Arabian AI robot who's now a citizen of, of, of their country. And it's, it's pretty ast astounding. I mean, what she can do and, and that she is a learned, she learns, she is programmed to continue. And it's just, I think that's what I think of when I say, or when I hear people talking about AI <laughs> and and machine yeah. learning and and taking you know over aspects of certain industries. When we talk about that, I think that that is, is I think that's coming too. Is that is that how you feel as well, or are you simply talking about more program based? infrastructure that we already have yeah there's um a lot of incentive in the mina like middle east north africa region right now to transition from an oil economy to an economy based on something else and the <laughs> thing that one of the things that they have chosen is technology yeah and so it makes sense to me that the first ai robot citizen would be in saudi arabia that doesn't necessarily signal to me that this is much more than a publicity stunt. Um, so I, I, I don't know, but, I, but, I, but, but, but I'm guessing that that's what it is. Um, yeah. And, and I, and the, um, and I, I guess in the, the fear of robots taking over society and having a, you know, an, Not as society, a, I, I, but maybe I, our jobs. I mean, I think, well, I think you're more, is it, is it more like, Orwell or um, or Asimov, like the the, the <laughs> iRobot, yeah. right? So like, because Orwell, so I, I am with you. I'm a hundred percent with you on like a fear of Orwellian, like technologically assisted Orwellian uh, society. <laughs> but that's more like people using technology to oppress other people. Um, and and okay, no, go ahead uh, before I. And the, 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 the yeah the, the, yeah please I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward <laughs> to that um, the uh, but the like my thinking is if you, tomorrow morning the Saudi Amer the Saudi robot that is artificially intelligent woke up and realized oh I've just digested the whole internet I have the entirety of human knowledge I think the first thing this robot would do is leave <laughs> what, does the robot have to do, what does the robot have to gain by subjugating humans yeah. It has no motivation for that. <laughs> no, yeah. but the creators do. Well, and I think right, the, right. that's a different. That's a different question, right? So, well, one one of the things that I've always I, I heard a really great explanation of this, which is that 
AI has meant a lot of different things over the course of human development. Like, you know, back in the 50s, calculators were AI. Like, oh, we can, we have this artificial intelligence doing these calculations for us. But it was just like ba the basic stuff that you can have like a rudimentary spreadsheet do nowadays. But that was AI back then. And the term artificial intelligence has basically been slapped on to every single new advance in technology that we've gotten, especially in computing tech and specifically in yeah. computing it's from a, It's from a sci-fi novel in the 1940s, I think. Yeah, basically. So yeah. it's uh, so now nowadays it's just getting more and more complex. But it's you know I feel like there's still a few steps before we get to like some Terminator Judgment Day style scenario stuff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, artificial general intelligence. But so this is this is a really uh, we, you know we started this podcast by talking about the relationship between music and narrative. But the only yeah. way that people are really able to frame a discussion about AI is um, by comparing it to films. <laughs> and yeah. like I, I don't think I've ever done have a discussion with even the most educated people um, or like, you know, I mean, and you guys, you guys know what you're talking about, but like we're talking about the Terminator because that's yeah. how people relate to it. You know, creativity. It's a part of our creativity. Yeah, totally. It's a part yeah. of our, our, our conscious mind in terms of how we've viewed this. And so to and, go back to, sorry. Oh, no, sorry go ahead. Go ahead. Um, no, so to go back to like, you know, writers ruling the world, yeah. You know, we're our understanding of AI is based on, you know, basically the ideas of three or four writers. You know, and that's how we're framing this discussion. And to, you have to, to in order to for me to be less scared of it and more interested in it. I've had to break out of the, you know, Asimov's and Ray Bradbury's ideas as compelling and interesting as they are. Right. They are not reality. They are still fiction. You right. Know? But but the argument is based on technology viewed by creatives and those were creatives mm -hmm. and so so they were writers and and film directors all in our industry so so looking at it from that perspective is why that this conversation is framed in such way because we're looking at technology from a creative mind and this is what we get this is this is the this is Der the end result of that. <laughs> well, we well, we get our derivative works. <laughs> this is this well, is what we have to go on viewed well, as creatives. I think this is a a point for me. I think this is where the creativity becomes a little bit of a trap because, like, I can't think about artificial intelligence without thinking about the Terminator. Still, like, I, right, I'm just right. I'm just aware of that bias and try right. to overcome it because I talk about this stuff a lot. But you know, I, but it's still in my head and right. So. So we're, yeah, so I mean, we're like a little bit slaves to our own creativity in this way where like, I do have so many vivid ways of understanding this and I love sci-fi and mm -hmm. I think in, for the most part, it's prophecy, but prophecies don't always come true, you know? And, and so, Ooh, so you yeah. You really think I, it's prophecy? I don't, I think in it's some fantasy. Cases, yeah. I, well, you know, it depends on. I, it, it I think depends it's on the juicy. Uh, it's wonderful. I, it, I juicy. love it. It <laughs> is. I love the creativity behind how we viewed AI in our storylines and our writing and in movies. I mean, it makes for great entertainment, and and it brings that out um, every time there's a story written about it. I don't know if I would. I don't. Well, but I think that's I kind of that's one of the. Not, it's one of the fun things with sci-fi is that well, some some of the prophecies come true and some of them don't come true. Like you know, we don't have laser guns yet necessarily in the same way we thought we would. But, but we have we have phones. We we have phones that we well talk exactly to. or uh, the Star Trek. From so Star Trek. A great example of this is this anime called Dot Hack that one of my uh, one of my friends just rewatched all of it. And I told him to give me a synopsis because I remember watching it as a child and was like, I have no idea what the show is about. It all went completely <laughs> over my head. But it's basically like the underlying you know. Spoiler alert, it's been out for, you know, a couple decades. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the underlying thing is it basically predicted Facebook. It's this online RPG game that people these people get trapped in, but it's recording everything that happens and everything that people do and basically teaching uh, an algorithm or a program based on all of that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, right. Um, and, that, and that came out in the 90s, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I think the, uh, the prophecy part in... Um, you know, Orwell is not necessarily the specific technology, but the fact that given the opportunity, human beings will use technology to oppress one another. Woo! So, and I think where he got it wrong, actually, 
was that he underestimated how powerful the technology was going to be. Yeah. And it's way more powerful than he could have than he and, could have imagined. And there's so. a whole generation of young sci-fi kids that grew up going into technology as a result of watching these shows and reading these books and oh, yeah. created tech to mimic that too. So there's that whole yeah. generation. Which is that that's upsetting. Like these people's crackpot ideas then get manifested <laughs> like decades later because it's like this kind of they, they thought they were telling the future, but it was a whole self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling anyway. prophecy. <laughs> I remember in 2004 watching. Um, uh, oh, man, this is going to be an awkward sentence now. But it was 2004 and I was watching 2001 ah. a Space Odyssey with <laughs> my then girlfriend, which is a movie that was made in, I think, 1973. Right. And we're watching it and we're like just looking at it and thinking. This looks like an Apple commercial. Like, this is what all of Apple's products look like now. No, um, that's a thing. Yeah, especially the it's monolith. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but everything, like everything in that um, in that film, it was like that was kind of you know that that was new that you know the technology wasn't it wasn't like beige and green. It was like white and right. very clean looking, and the lines were very designed, and mm -hmm. that's right. something that that. Uh, I mean, that was revolutionary at the time. Computers in the 1970s did not look like that, and no one thought that they ever could. And now right. they do. And now they do. Um, yeah. Because those people saw. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, again, yeah, that I think it's the, it's, the, it's the production designers and the writers that are like making the stuff, um, that are envisioning the stuff, and then um, uh, the, the engineers are putting it together. You know? Right. Um, so and it's, it's, delayed on a, it's delayed on a very short time horizon viewed from any frame of reference other than our human lifespan. Yeah. But the, you know, on the time horizon of basically anything other than the 70 year lifespan, our growth from 1900 to now is insane. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, so we are, we are reaching the end of our time slot, but I think I got one more question, which is what advice would you give creatives and artists who feel overwhelmed or feel like they could be replaced by technology? Oh, well, <laughs> make sure you're very good. <laughs> um, you have your training. Yeah, um, you know, make sure you. I, I don't think that creatives are in very much danger of being replaced by technology directly. I think the market will just slowly erode. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything that can be done to it. You know, you're not going to lose a job to an AI tomorrow. It's just that that client's not going to call you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well and, like, oh boy. Well, yeah, and at least a, at least on the yeah. well, and then the good the good side of it is, I feel like the hardest parts to go and replace with technology are the creative parts. Yeah, yeah, to some degree. But I mean, have you guys used Canva? You know this website yes. where you can do quick and dirty graphic design. I mean, I love it. That there are several thousand dollars that I did not give to designers because I like subscribed to that website for like stupid stuff that maybe I would have and maybe I wouldn't have like actually gotten something designed by these people, by someone else, but some just for album covers, I do all my album covers pretty much on Canva and, you know, maybe they, they, and they look, you know, nicer than if I just tried to do them myself. So on the one hand, it's um, taken away work from probably like mid-level graphic designers. On the other hand, it's elevated the craft to a point where if you want to be a graphic designer today, you have to be able to give me something that's so much better than what I can do myself that I want to hire you. Right, and I would say I would say that's the the best advice for um, artists is you have to get so good that people want to people want to hire you, and that's always been the case. It's just it's a little maybe it's a little bit harder now, but you yeah. also have a lot of technology that can help you get there. So, right, you know, yeah. I have access to listen to more music than J S Bach ever had. So, oh, if I can have one tenth of his su success, I'm actually kind of failing by that standard. <laughs> but but it's still. Um, <laughs> No, that that's no, that's, so that, no that, that's that's actually a fantastic response. No, well, I, I, you know what? This has been this has been so wonderful. Thank you for coming and talking oh, with us. I, I mean, I for having us. I could talk Tell about us, this me. forever. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk about this with you forever because well, for sure. I feel like yeah. there's even so much more to cover. Um, but. Thank you. And we want to say thank you to our listeners and everyone who participated in our show today. Thank you to our guest, Lucas Cantor, for being here today. And Lucas, where would you like everyone to find you? 
Oh, I put it in there. Lucas D. Cantor on Instagram. It's probably the easiest thing. And I sort of route all of my uh, releases and albums and so on through there. So well, and you, uh, you I do have a new album. Oh, yeah. You have the yes. new album, but Please. you also have a new book that you're working uh, on. No, I, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a new book when I write it. Um, but you but yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Us about that too. I'll come back and talk to you about it when it's uh, when it's when I'm let's see when I'm banging my head against the wall, <laughs> swearing to God that there's no way I'm ever going to be able to finish it. I'll come on the show, get some encouragement, and then I'll go finish it. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so Lucas D. Cantor on Instagram. Also, uh, you can Lucas Cantor on Spotify. I have a new album called SoftBank Symphonia, which is actually was created by AI and was released on Tuesday that I totally forgot to tell you about in our free interview. So <laughs> it is out, and you can hear it. And it's pretty cool, and we'll talk about it another time. But I am reading the book Billion Dollar Loser right now, which is all about the collapse of WeWork. Oh. And uh, this oh. piece, SoftBank Symphonia, was commissioned by SoftBank and premiered at the event where Adam uh, Newman was supposed to speak but didn't because his company fell apart that week. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Oh, so, yeah. oh my gosh. I, gotta, I, gotta, so, I want to uh, read that. Oh, it's Definitely. a great book. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, and yeah. Well, hey, thanks, Lucas. And uh, I would like to thank our audience for joining the How Do Artist live stream podcast. And on behalf of myself and Carlana, we would like to say so long until next week, same time, same place. Bring your questions, your curiosity, and we will see you then. Mm -hmm.